Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And no doubt the title for this video is a bit of a clue about what we're talking about today. We're looking at another play by William Shakespeare. This is one of his history plays, dealing with the life and times of King Henry V of England. I want to look at this play by Shakespeare within its historical and performative context, and I hope you're going to find it useful. Let's go. To start with, let's look at where the play Henry V sits within the timeline William Shakespeare's other dramatic works. What I'm showing you here is a contested chronology of William Shakespeare's extant plays. And I say contested because even now there is disagreement over the precise date or year when some of these plays were written and produced. I am using the Norton Shakespeare's timeline from the second edition. Other people disagree, usually only by a couple of years at the most when some of these plays were first produced. For me, and many others, the Norton Shakespeare is a reputable version of the complete works of William Shakespeare. Therefore, its timeline, as far as I'm concerned, is as good as any other on the market. It may not be perfect, but then I would say we're not going to know for sure either way. William Shakespeare's history plays, which of course includes Henry V, come from a similar root source. Hollinshed's Chronicles, which I did make a video on for this channel and I will be sure to leave linked in a card up here. However, I do think we need to be a little bit careful about terming something as a history play. While all of the things that are grouped as history plays have a source coming from Hollinshed's Chronicles, there are other plays in the Shakespeare canon that also use the Chronicles as a source, namely Macbeth, Cymbeline and King Lear. But these plays are excluded from the history plays, despite the fact that they are based on the real historical figures from British history. But it's not Shakespeare's grouping, is it? The history plays, the tragedies and the comedies have been grouped up by Heming and Condell when they were formatting and putting together William Shakespeare's first folio after his death. The first folio wasn't printed until 1623. And I've made a video on the first folio which I will also leave linked in a card up here. So I want to try something a little bit different on this channel and I'm not sure how it's going to work so you'll have to let me know what you think in the comments section down below. But I want to try to get interactive and do a pop quiz. So what I'm going to do is pull up that contested chronology that I had up at the start of this video once again. But I've made a slight change you can see here. I have highlighted the so-called history plays, those that are grouped as such in the first folio by Heming and Condell. In a moment I'm going to ask you to pause this video so we can figure out just how familiar you are with England's monarchs. Because what I want you to do is put these monarchs in their correct historical order by reign. Now, spoiler alert, this is different from the date order in which the plays about them were first presented. After you hit pause, make a note of the correct order that you think these monarchs reigned in. And then, once you're done, hit play again. Now, press pause is the correct chronology of Shakespeare's monarchs from his history plays as grouped in the first folio. How many did you get right? Did you get them all right? Let me know in the comments section down below. You may notice that there is something odd going on with Henry VI, Shakespeare's play from 1591. But as you can see, it says here that Henry VI reigned from 1422 to 1461, and then again from 1470 to 1471. Perhaps you know what's going on there. When we look at this timeline and we think about Henry VI, we are forced to question what right to rule means. What happens when physical might trumps monarchical right? Is divine right absolute? And what does it mean? If a rebel rises up and then is successful, defeats a monarch in battle, ends their life and becomes monarch in their place, is this proof of their right to rule? God has favoured them in battle, so therefore they are rightful king. William Shakespeare is staging the lives and deaths of these monarchs. Arguably, therefore, he is posing similar questions to his audiences. Nevertheless, he is doing so in many cases, centuries after the events themselves took place. But 
The questions are, however, pertinent, and I wonder what it means to ask these questions in 1599, the year that Henry V is believed to have been written and performed. Let's look at the historical context of 1599 in English history. Here we have the coronation portrait of Elizabeth I. It shows the Queen crowned, wearing the cloth of gold that she wore at her coronation on the 15th of January 1559. This garment had previously been worn for the coronation of her elder half-sister, Mary I. Elizabeth holds the orb and scepter, symbols of her authority. The portrait is dated to around 1600, but is probably a copy of a lost original from the time of the coronation in 1559. So this portrait is being painted within a year, we think, of Henry V first being staged by William Shakespeare's company. In 1599, Elizabeth I has been on the throne for 41 years. She is the unmarried Virgin Queen of England. As such, she has no heir. And by this point, even her staunchest supporters must have come to terms with the fact that she was unlikely to produce any heir. She is in her 66th year, and indeed would only live for four more years. She died on the 24th of March, 1603. I have chosen to place beside this portrait of Elizabeth at her coronation an image of one of her leading favourites, probably painted to celebrate his role in the Accession Day tilt of 1595. This is because he is depicted wearing such elaborately fine armour. What we are seeing here is an image of Robert Devereux, the 33-year-old second Earl of Essex. In 1598, he had committed the great faux pas of losing his temper and turning his back on his queen. The following year, the year of Henry V in 1599, he had managed to gain Elizabeth's forgiveness. She made him Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and tasked him with putting down an Irish rebellion. Between 1593 and 1603 was a period known as the Nine Years' War in Ireland, also called Tyrone's Rebellion, after Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, its ringleader. The expectation was that as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Essex would go over and sort it all out. Return Ireland to obedience to the English Queen. At home, a swift victory for the English was expected, to be led by this dashing young military hero. This national hope and expectation finds its voice, arguably, in the prologue to Act V of Henry V. The mayor and all his brethren in best sort, like to the senators of the antique Rome, with the plebeians swarming at their heels, go forth and fetch their conquering Caesar in. As, by a lower loving likelihood, were now the general of our gracious empress, as in good time he may, from Ireland coming, bringing rebellion broached on his sword. How many would the peaceful city quit to welcome him? Much more, and much more cause did they this harry. In this, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, is being linked with Henry V, and also, therefore, with Caesar. Elizabeth is the Empress, William Shakespeare is pointing out through his play that the expectation is that like a conquering hero like Caesar or Henry V, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, will return to England with Irish rebellion broached on his sword, in true service of his great empress, Queen Elizabeth I. As it would turn out, however, Essex's force was underfunded, and what money there was, the Earl of Essex misspent. Without royal permission, Essex made a peace with Tyrone, knighted his officers and returned to England. Perhaps understandably, the ageing Queen Elizabeth was furious and she was determined to punish Essex, banishing him from her presence and denying him access to his monopolies, the things that earned him his fortune. All of this eventually would lead up to the Essex Rebellion, Indeed, it was only just around the corner and would occur on the 8th of February, 1601. Indeed, the ties between Shakespeare's company and the Essex faction would also be evident the night before this rebellion took place. 
I talk about it in my video on Shakespeare's play Richard II, which I will also leave linked in a card. Shakespeare's company was paid extra to stage Richard II with the banned deposition scene left in the night before this rebellion was to take place. The play was staged at the Globe. Upon hearing of the staging of this play, Elizabeth I allegedly claimed, I am Richard II, know ye not that. But how was the figure of Henry V being remembered at the time of Shakespeare's play? Here we have items that for many centuries were known as King Henry V's armour and war equipment. They functioned as his funeral achievements from his tomb in Westminster Abbey. For those seeking a day's entertainment in London in 1599, it's highly likely that Westminster Abbey might be one of their first ports of call. Once inside, surely the tomb of that great war hero Henry V would be top of their list. There they would see these funeral achievements. If they had more time to kill, maybe they would make their way to Southwark, to the newly erected Globe Theatre, also built in 1599. And there they could enjoy seeing that very same king have his life and victory staged. Not to be a spoil sport, but in recent years, the provenance of these items and their connection to Henry V has been questioned. Take, for example, the Limewood Shield, which has a small section of crimson velvet remaining on the inner side, which bear the arms of Navarre. Joan of Navarre was Henry V's stepmother. So the argument has been made that rather than being Henry V's shield, this may instead have belonged to Henry IV. Additionally, if we look at the helm, this probably didn't go with Henry V to Agincourt. This five-section domed helm is about 16 inches high. It has an applied decoration band of copper alloy around the bottom edge. It is, rather than a war helm, a jousting or tilting helm. It would not have been worn into battle. Also, the sword. Found in the Abbey in 1869, tantalisingly, it has the cross of St George in the pommel. For many years, it was thought to be part of the funeral armour. However, more recent research has shown that this sword was much later than the time of Henry V probably close to the time of Henry VII, but nobody would have known this in 1599. They would have been able to see the tomb of Henry V and whatever funerary achievement was on display around it. They would have seen these things and connected them to the great English victories in France. Henry V was England's warrior king. So perhaps he makes a particularly fitting figure for Shakespeare's company to stage, as they had their own celebration in 1599, namely the opening of their brand new theatre in Southwark, the Globe. And if we look at the prologue to the play Henry V, it is clear that making reference to their new theatre is high on the agenda. They might be quite deprecating of its capacity to show the splendour of the warfare of Henry V, but I think that by mentioning it at all, they are drawing connections with celebrating Henry V and celebrating their new theatre. Let's look at it. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, and gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? O oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high, upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts, into a thousand parts divide on man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. 
for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hour glass, for the which supply admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. Evidently, through this prologue, the globe is being questioned. Can this small circular space ever pay a fitting tribute to stage the great events that it plans to, when it details the life and triumphs of Henry V and his England? However, it's not just the globe that's being questioned. I think that within this play, Henry V himself is being queried. His personality and his legacy. The man and the king are not always being lionised by Shakespeare's play. If we look at this speech by the Dauphin from Act 2, Scene 4, he talks about how England is so idly kinged, her sceptre so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fear attends her not. And for those audience members who had encountered the feckless, idle youth, Prince Hal, in the Henry IV plays, they might have seen that the Dauphin had a point to make. Here is Prince Henry, the future Henry V, speaking in Henry IV, Part 1, Act 1, Scene 2. He announces the following. I know you all and will a while uphold the unyoked humour of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself being wanted, he may be more wondered at. By breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapours that did seem to strangle him, if all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. But when they seldom come, they wished for come, as nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So when this loose behaviour I throw off, and pay the debt I never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes, and like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation, Glittering o'er my fault, shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offence a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. In Henry IV, this character of Prince Henry, the future Henry V, is saying that he will act as poorly as possible intentionally, so that when he chooses to reform himself, it will look better to those who had judged him harshly previously. Is this really the attitude that we want from a king? Does this seem like a sensible war leader, a monarch who we can place our faith in? Or is this really a cunning scheme? Is Prince Hal a mastermind of sorts? By setting himself up as this feckless idle youth, he can surprise those around him, not only his countrymen, but his future enemies. Does this show him as a potentially weak king to be, or an incredibly strong and powerful one? Let me know what you think in the comments section down below. Do we see traces of the old Prince Hal in the moment where King Henry puts on a disguise and moves among his soldiers? When he has his encounter with Bates, Court and Williams? When conversing particularly with Bates and Williams, Henry V is forced to confront the fact that they believe that any king who takes his men into battle is responsible for their immortal souls. If he has led them into some sinful act through this combat, it is he, they believe, who must bear the burden. When these soldiers part company with their disguised king, William Shakespeare makes the choice to stage Henry V sinking into self-pity. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. O oh, hard condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool, whose sense no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not too, save ceremony? 
save general ceremony. What art thou, thou idle ceremony? I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the balm, the scepter and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the fast title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread, never sees horrid night, the child of hell, but like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labour to his grave. And but for ceremony, such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but in gross brain little wots. What watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages? For me, a clear example of William Shakespeare's decision to stage a contested narrative of the figure of Henry V appears here. In Act 4, Scene 6. An alarm sounds, and Henry V responds by saying, But hark, what new alarm is this same? The French have reinforced their scattered men, then every soldier kill his prisoners. The stage direction reads, the soldiers kill their prisoners. What William Shakespeare has chosen to stage here is one of the most conflicted and contested moments from the whole history of the Battle of Agincourt. The moment where Henry V is said to have given the order to massacre the French prisoners being held by his men. It is said that he believed that the French forces were mounting back up, ready to re-attack his troops, and he was worried that the prisoners might form a danger to his men. That if the French forces came from one side, the prisoners themselves might also attack, leaving the English army sandwiched between these two violent enemies. But in doing this, and potentially keeping his men safe, what he does is breach codes of conduct. About chivalry, the treatment of prisoners of war, at this time, the expectation for many was that prisoners of war would be ransomed back to their families. By not doing this, by breaching this code of chivalry, we must question what kind of a king, a general and a war maker Henry V is. Is this act tyrannical? And with these questions in mind, we then also have to ask why William Shakespeare chooses to stage this moment at all. There are so many moments from the life of Henry V that he could choose to stage. He could choose to stage Agincourt as an uncomplicated, uncontested victory by the English over the French. By putting this moment in, it puts a query in our minds. And I wonder why you think William Shakespeare chooses to do this. Do let me know in the comments section down below. Indeed, the contested nature of the personality and monarchy of King Henry V infects the world of the play. And Shakespeare sees it right through to the end. In the last moment of action, the audience is given this hope. Queen Isabel, mother of Catherine of Valois, the wife of King Henry V, says the following. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one, as man and wife, being two, are one in love. So be there twixt your kingdom such a spousal that never may ill office or fell jealousy which troubles oft the bed of blessed marriage thrust in between the paction of these kingdoms to make divorce of their incorporate league. That English may as French, French Englishmen receive each other. God speak this, Amen. All reply, Amen. King Henry V. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day my Lord of Burgundy will take your oath, and all the peers for surety of our leagues, then shall I swear to Kate and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. 
there we have the end of Act 5, Scene 2. And it would seem that all is well. Peace will reign. England will marry France. The monarchies will combine, particularly, of course, in their heir. There will be a royal heir of France and England who will be able to rule over both nations. But Shakespeare, it seems, is unwilling to let this happy ending rest without being questioned. And so he gives his audience this epilogue as a parting gift. From the chorus. Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author has pursued the story. In little room confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small most greatly lived, this star of England, fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden be achieved, and of it left his son, imperial lord. Henry the Sixth, in infant bands crowned king of France and England did this king succeed, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown, and for their sake, in your fair minds, let this acceptance take. Henry V's marriage to Catherine of Valois was a peace treaty. Out of this marriage, of course, was produced their child, Henry VI. Because of Henry V's untimely death, their son was crowned as an infant. To history, Henry VI is remembered as an ineffectual and deposed monarch. But Henry V's marriage to Catherine of Valois also brought her to England, and after his early death, his widow formed a relationship with a Welshman, Owen Tudor. From that relationship was produced two boys, Edmund and Jasper. Edmund would go on to marry Margaret Beaufort, and together they would produce one child, Henry Tudor, the future Henry VII. So arguably, in the marriage of Henry V to Catherine of Valois, the seeds were laid for the rising up of the Tudor dynasty. What Shakespeare is staging in 1599, in the final years of the last monarch of the Tudor dynasty, is the moment of the genesis of her house. I've always found it quite difficult to get a handle on what Shakespeare is intending with these quite contested genesis points. And I'm not simply talking about Henry V. I'm thinking about all of the kings that Shakespeare stages in his so-called history plays, as they are grouped in the first folio. Perhaps from that I would like to exclude Henry VIII, which I think functions quite differently. But in the rest of the history plays, Shakespeare doesn't present what I see as traditional divine right monarchs. Their humanity is present, and as such, they are flawed. They are occasionally fearful, feckless, idle, tyrannical, but also brave, noble, and kingly. But in doing so, in showing this humanity, the two sides of them, I wonder where the space for them to be divine, to have that divine right comes in. And if that is in question in Shakespeare's play, what does that mean for the kings that he is writing under and the queens? What does it mean in 1599 to have these contested kingships when you have a queen on the throne who everybody is aware will be the last of her dynasty? The Tudors will die out with Elizabeth, and in 1599, there are many thinking that it's probably going to happen fairly soon. So what is Shakespeare doing? I'm not sure, and I wonder what you think is going on, so I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. As always, I will leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box down below. Follow me there, and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you found this video interesting and useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up button. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, why not hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.